Thanks a lot. Millions of lessons learned on electronic napkins on the way to freeing education. As academics, we have to start with the definition, of course. We looked that up in the Encyclopedia Galactica, and this is what the Encyclopedia Galactica has to say. Of course, imagine that sound. Napkins were invented in the early 20th century to conduct informal one-on-one -on -one lessons in a bar or a cafe. This resulted from everybody noticing that regular classroom lectures are good for only two things. First, looking important as a lecturer, and second, getting a nap as a student, hence the name napkin. <laughs> In 1981, Donald E. Knuth, who invented about everything in computer science, as you know, turned the napkin, the paper napkin, into a semi-electronic napkin. This is a screenshot of one of his recordings. Drawing with paper and pencil, being recorded with a TV camera. He explains tech, by the way, in that lecture. In 2007, Salman Khan highly popularized that style of lecturing on YouTube with his mathematics, introductory mathematics videos on YouTube. In 2009, I started with my mathematics and computer science videos on YouTube, pretty much the same style with inverted colors. If you notice, it's black on white, not white on black. And eventually this year, Sebastian and I met when we started working for Udacity, creating classes for Udacity's website. Massive open online courses. That's the actual topic of this talk. MOOCs, massive open online courses. Actually, there's two types of massive open online courses, the C MOOCs and the X MOOCs. And C MOOCs are the earlier ones, focusing, say, on social sciences. This is not what we're going to cover. We're co going to cover the current style of MOOC, that's the X MOOC, the Stanford style of MOOCs, what has been introduced by Udacity. And as I guess everybody has seen in the media, these sort of quote unquote napkins are in high demand. Udacity was the first Stanford spin off to start this as a business. Coursera was quickly after that. Coursera is now the biggest player in town, with Stanford and lots of other universities contributing to the pool of MOOCs hosted on Coursera. And then there's edX, which started out as a cooperation between the MIT and Harvard University in Boston. Now it includes Berkeley as well and the University System of Texas as well. All within one year. So this really looks like a high demand. Now Sebastian is going to talk about the financial perspective. Yeah, so the, the question of course is why is, is there such a high demand? So, so why do so many online courses uh, spring up? Why are there so many companies being founded around online courses? And one way to look at this is the financial perspective. But since this is kind of a lecture, we're going to quiz you as, as <laughs> like we quiz our students. So what do you estimate is the cost of tuition and living for one year at an average U.S. university? You can just show your hands. So who thinks it's $10,000 per year? Nobody. 20000 Okay. 30, uh, 40000 It's actually not that expensive if you go to a public U.S. university. It's only, only $20,000. What about Harvard? 40000 60000 100? Officially, they say 60,000, so um, it, it might be a bit higher, but, but that's tuition. Now, what about Germany, actually? We're, we have a cheap education system. What does it cost to study in Germany for one year at a German university? Tuition and living? Nothing? 1,000 euros? 10,000? Exactly, living. So, so you spend around 10,000 euros for, for, for tuition and living. So everybody is investing a lot of time and money into going to university. So, so if, if you're a student, well, you, you spend a few years going to university. You also spend a lot of money, but so between 10,000 euros and uh, $60,000, depending on where you want to be educated. But also as a society, so uh, we're investing time, obviously, so, so the universities cost a lot of money. Um, but also we're, we're, you know, we're hiring very expensive people uh, who supposedly are very highly qualified uh, professors and asking them to do 
lecturing. So, so they could spend their time on something else. They could spend their time on, on doing research, cutting edge science and all that stuff. So that is one of the aspects why, why we think that, that there's such a high interest in online courses, because obviously once the course is recorded and, and you can just play it, you can do that at a very low cost per student. The question, of course, is, is all this time and money that we're investing, is that a smart investment to do? Which is the question you have to ask if, you, if you're talking about online courses. And as a student, I think the answer is obviously yes. Provided you can afford to, to go to university, you just should. It's, it's still a very good route to, to you know, getting a good job, landing a high salary. Although there has been a diminishing return over the past decades, it's no longer a guarantee um, to you know, get the high profile job. But still, as a student, it's a good investment. As a society, um, as I just said, I think we're a bit overpaying because we're hiring, you know, we have all these huge buildings with very expensive people in there. And we ask them to give the same lecture every year again and again and again. So one way of looking at this might be that recording courses online is actually quite a good way to, to make this a smarter investment into education. But obviously, that's only one side of the equation. You're going to talk about the other one. Yeah. So what's in there for society? What does society actually need? Again, we start with the quiz. When were the first universities founded? 200 years ago, 400 years ago, 800 years ago? Who says 200 years ago? Nobody, okay. Show of hand, 400 years ago? Okay, some, 800 years? Okay, you're right, the majority. So, <laughs> yeah. So the University of Bologna, Cambridge, Oxford were founded a pretty long time ago to satisfy some need of that society in those day and age. The first modern university, so a university that tightly integrates research and teaching, a university that aims at personal growth and a university that does research just for the sake of research, a modern type of university, how old is that? 50 years? Anybody? 100 years? More? 200 years? You see, actually 200 years. I guess half of you said over 100 years. Actually 200 years. What's now called the Humboldt University in Berlin was the first one of that style. So we're dealing with a pretty old model of university. Does that still fit to the needs of today's society? What has survived is the model. You get a university certificate, you use that certificate to get a job, you are trained on the job, and maybe after a while you decide, oh, I do a master's degree and whatever, go back to university. This is the model from the outside, the formal model, but does that really work? What society would need is that those students are able to do something, some mastery of useful skills. They should be able to apply their knowledge. They should not just possess knowledge, they should be able to apply it, which is a different story. <laughs> They should have a portfolio of skills. If I employ one of these students, I should be knowing what they can do and what they cannot do. It shouldn't be just a list of, of subject names on a certificate. And of course, a big portion would be personal development. We have a nice term for that in German, Bildung. The, it's not education. That's which is not education. It should be more than education. The university should provide that. And as everybody knows, from the media and these days, universities have tough problems with these needs of society. We've still got the model, but we hardly fulfill those needs. The question is, do MOOCs come to the rescue? And more of them, and even more of them. Could that help? So here's what the optimists have to say and the optimists about the MOOCs are well generally they're they're in America right now more specifically mostly of them are Californian they say MOOCs will come to the rescue so their view is is the following well first of all they're using this statistic as an example which which again we're going to do as a quiz so I'm going to explain that so take two groups of students one group of students receives a normal university lecture the average you know the professor standing there lecturing to the students the other group all receive individual tutoring. And now both of these groups take a test, the same test. And my question to you is, how much better are those students that have received individual tutoring compared to the group that has received a lecture? So who thinks there's no difference? Okay, a few people. Next the option I'm going to offer you, 73% of the individually tutored students are better than the average lectured student. Okay, that's quite a lot. 
Who thinks it's 98%? And it is surprisingly actually 98%. So. You mean face to face tutoring? Yes, individual face to face yeah, tutoring. Not online. <laughs> yeah, no, not online. So, so it's a study that was done individual one to one tutoring. And that's, of course, what the optimist thinks. Oh, it's great, you know, because if you, of course, it's not only about recording a video, but it's also adding interactive elements to that so that you provide quizzes to the students that they can work on. You have automatically great homework. You can provide cues and exercises if it's done right. It's not just the video that you watch, but you can actually add lots of interactive elements around that. And that's great. So basically, everybody could be learning from the best teachers for free. You just have to you know, find the best teacher somewhere out there in the world, get them to do a course, then you record it, and it's there forever. You know, everybody could learn from, from Richard Feynman about physics if, if he were still alive. Students can be engaged on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Of course, it's a sort of mechanical engagement, which, uh, but still, nevertheless, you know, the computer is very patient. If uh, You can achieve mastery. If you, if you have a question um, and you want to ask that question five times, you just click backwards on the video and you watch it again, or you ask a question to the forum. It's, infinite patience uh, until you have understood the, the concept. So that's one of the things that the optimists are saying is we can actually, at very low cost, emulate free one-to-one -one tutoring. And then if you're even more idealistic, you can say, of course, we're also going to change education for the better. We're going to free education of bureaucracy, you know, that 200-year-old system and the bad old teaching habits that lecture where, you know, there's, there's really no connection to the students at all. Or we could also turn education into a data-driven science because there's lots of data being recorded while a student is taking one of these courses. So and we're going to talk more about that later. We can actually see where the students are failing, where we as lecturers have been failing, where we have not explained something right. So that we then see a drop in attendance or we see a drop in the test scores on the quizzes that come in between. If you go very far, the kind of most idealistic concept is, I, I think, the inverted classroom, where people say, well, normally it's this way. You go to a lecture, and then you practice doing homework. What if you first learned about this concept using massive open online courses at home, and then the lecturer is actually there for you once you go to the university or once you go into the classroom to practice those concepts with you. So uh, Salman Khan, founder of Khan Academy, basically says technology can actually humanize the classroom because there's more time to spend or more meaningful time that you can spend with your students. But of course, that's just the optimist view. So the generic pessimist. <laughs> Again, a quiz. To indicate one of the major issues, this year 40,000 students took that massive open course uh, by Stanford on natural language processing. How many of these actually made it through the course? 3%? <laughs> Quite a number, okay. 12%? You're all pessimists. <laughs> <laughs> 23%? Just a few? Okay, you're, you're, right. you're so close. <laughs> So there seems to be an issue about this type of education. It obviously cannot fulfill all those promises that you just heard about. Jörn is actually a professor, so imagine him, you know, <laughs> just having 3% of his students pass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody would be interfering. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. So criticism number one is you are way too much optimistic. It doesn't work like that. We've been doing distant education for decades, if not centuries, it doesn't work like that. You need the right type of students, and at any rate, you can't have these type of successes that you suppose. Then, the lack of quality. If you actually look into what's being recorded, what's being published as MOOCs, admittedly, the quality is not that high on average. The didactics is debatable. These courses do not fit together. These are not pieces of a puzzle that fit together. It's just scattered knowledge. There is no evaluation going on besides journalists looking at these courses or even professors like Rolf Schumeister looking at these courses, but there is no real thorough uh, evaluation going on. And we're not using tons of the technical amenities that we have. Video conferencing, virtual reality, interactive experiments done online, stuff like that, it's not being used as much as it could be. It's just more or less videotaped lectures plus quizzes, electronic quizzes. And then, if you're not paying, the regular quote, if you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, 
you're the goods, you're the product. If you're not paying, something is wrong. You should be careful. So most of these courses are free, I think. Ah, you got it. I, I guess most of you yeah. know, but, but taking these courses is actually free. So, mm -hmm. so whether it's on Coursera, on edX, or Udacity, um, you just have to provide an email address. Basically. That's the second aspect of open. Open means open to everybody, not depending on any prior certificate, and open meaning you don't need to pay. So somebody has to pay. Who is going to pay? Are you paying with your data? Hmm, that's tricky. And a general comment about distance education, if you send out in broadcast mode, if you send out these videos, if you have the same quizzes for everybody, that's the one size fits all approach. Which is of course really very different than the traditional university. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very different. <laughs> As we said, this is <laughs> these are these are the generic arguments we're going to discuss yeah, what we think about them. <laughs> And, of course, if you think about university providing a certificate, some sort of authoritative certificate at the end, you want to know that that person who took that course actually also was the one who took the test and that there was no cheating on the test and there is no plagiarism going on. Of course, there's a huge deal of plagiarism and cheating going on in these courses. Again, you might say, mm, don't we have the same in regular universities going on? But in this case, it's a big argument against MOOCs. And it's also on different scales. So there's actually websites that will offer to take your courses for you. So you, you can basically sign up to the university, then you sign up to the... I don't know who that even is, but, but they, they will, they will take, take that course for you, you know, submit your exams and everything. It's, it's the same one. So, so the same thing that you can educate 40,000 students, you can also have one guy you know, taking 40,000 exams. <laughs> Now you can go to new. <laughs> yes. So, so, so this, yeah, exactly. So, so this is this is kind of the the general picture. So, so there's there's those three massive open online courses. Some people are getting very excited about this. The basically it's the Californians getting excited about it, and the Germans and the East Coast getting you know criticizing it. But maybe that's too. So what we came here to talk about is what we have learned because just as, as Jörn said, you know we. Well, probably we are part of that debate in, in some way, but we just gave two courses. And so we wanted to just tell you our experience from, from giving those courses. We played a very small part, uh, just to illustrate how small a part we played. So guess, what's the total number of users claimed by the major MOOCs? So, so Coursera, edX, Udacity, as of 2012. So how many users do they claim in total? Do they claim 100,000? No. One million. 2.5 million. Yes, it's 2.5 million. Of course, that's just users. So, so you all know, is it unique double users? Counted. Yeah, double counted. Um, do these users actually make it all the way through? But this is the number of people that are at least willing to give their email address for free. <laughs> some email address of theirs. Some, some email address <laughs> into an a web form. <laughs> so, 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 and Jörn and I, I mean, our courses are in the range of, of a few thousand. So, so we're a very, very small, small part in that. But still, we had, we had several good experiences. So the first thing that we experienced is that there is a craving to learn out there. This is an offering where there's high demand for it. Both our courses went online, I think, yours in September, uh, my, mine in October, and we chose the, you know, the really highly popular topic. So Jörn gave a course on differential equations. Um, I taught theoretical Everybody computer science. Topic. Yeah. The, <laughs> so, so, you know, not, talking about mass education, um, those are probably not the topics that you would choose. And nevertheless, we had thousands of students actually taking those courses and uh, you know, having, having online, like, vigorous online debates on uh, differential equations and NP-completeness and all of those topics. Of course, we know we're picking the easy students, so, so we're having this offering out there and it's easy, if, if you think you know, you're offering this to the world, it's easy to find thousands of students who are actually interested in, in, in these kind of things, uh, such as probably this audience. But nevertheless, you know, there, there's this, you put this offering out there and immediately people come. So, so there is just a high demand to learn things. What we both also found is that the freedom provided by these massive open online courses is good. Because it's, well, there's no accreditation, right? There's no formal verification of these courses, which is often a criticism. But actually, it's wonderful if you're a teacher, because you can try new things. You're not bound to any curriculum. You can, you can basically give the course in a way that you, you think it, it should be done. 
instead of the way it has always been done. So one example that you know you might understand is in, in, in theoretical computer science. Uh, you cannot take a theoretical computer science course without talking about a Turing machine. Actually, you can, but everybody you know everybody has has that Turing machine concept in there, so it's always stayed in there. And and when when I made my course, I found out you you can just throw it out. You don't need it. But that would never have been possible at a traditional university Same. because. Same for the differential equations yeah. course. I do differential equations in depth, even partial differential equations, without mentioning the integral. I'm never integrating anything in that course. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good course. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so you can teach the way you want to be. And actually, the, the, the good thing is also you can be a teacher. I mean, I mean, Jörn does this uh, professionally. You, you teach a lot. You're, you're a professor at a university. I do totally different stuff, but I just wanted to teach theoretical computer science because I like the subject. I would never have had the opportunity to do that for, for any audience that makes sense. So, so that's also something great. You can be a teacher for something that's, you know, that you're passionate about and then stop being a teacher again. That's very good. What we also learned, interaction. So, so this, is, this is one of the weaknesses we think of most of the courses that are out there uh, right now. Because many people just say, oh, you know, if you write on the napkin in a bar, the most important part is not somebody writing on the napkin and watching them do it. It's the explanation and the interaction you have with that person. And so you need to use technology to emulate that kind of interaction. You need to have quizzes. So, so what, what we do basically after just on average, I think every three minutes of explaining a concept, we'll ask a question to the students that they have to answer. So you have to have a multiple choice selection, you have to calculate something, and only then can you, can you go on in, in the course. So this, this constant interaction, reinforcing, seeing how the students learn it, that is a very important element. We should be talking about the style of quizzes. Actually, the style of quizzes that we're doing right now in this lecture is not the right style of quizzes. You should be asking quizzes that demand thinking, that provoke thinking, <laughs> in-depth thinking, not just guessing. Guessing doesn't cut it. Yeah, so, so we are obviously constrained to multiple choice uh, most of the time, or we do, we do some, some calculation. Um, but, um, or programming, which is... Or programming, yes, programming is also something that's possible. Obviously, you know, the, the social sciences still have to figure out what they are going to do in Python. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> Philosophy in Python, that's... <laughs> um, but beyond the quizzes, we are both very active on the forums of our courses. And, and the students are also very active, so that's actually a second very important part. You can get lots of students debating with each other, asking the questions about things they haven't understood. And I think it's the same with your course, what always amazes me, they ask lots of questions that are actually beyond the scope of the course. So you can really see they've understood the concept and now they want to learn new stuff, advance their knowledge, which I find very amazing. I've never seen that at university. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and they do find all my mistakes in the... In the oh the yes, they're, they're relentless. Um, in the programming quizzes. <laughs> It's still, though, you know, given all this interaction, it's still a lot of delivery. So, so that's, that's the same teaching at, at a university or teaching online. You send out a lot of stuff, you, you really invest a lot of time into this. You don't get very much back. So you get a bit of data, or, or massive data, uh, depending on how many students you have. But other than that, it's still a tiny fraction of the students interacting. So we are, we are aware of that. But talking about data, we found the data that we collected invaluable. So, so my course, for example, went online in October. I've already exchanged, I think, about 20 of the three-minute videos, simply because there was this forum discussion going on where people say, oh, I don't understand this. Or we saw in the statistics that once I start asking the quiz, testing knowledge, everybody got it wrong. So it was a very good feedback for me to see where, where I uh, you know, could, could be a better teacher. And, and then it's very easy to exchange. So it's kind of this optimizing the lecture. You put out something, and then you get the feedback from the students. And you get a lot of feedback, especially there's, there's a few students who can really you know, find everything. Um, and, then you, and then you can just keep on improving your course, so, so advancing it. And every time you know, somebody gives you feedback, it becomes better, which is really, really great concept, also not in traditional university. Jörn just mentioned it. Um, well, so, so the first thing is we learn to focus on quality. Um, the course, and by quality, we don't mean that the course needs to be glossy. If you watch a course on Udacity, it's basically very ugly four-bit color scheme um, 
with my hand drawing something or Jörn's hand drawing something. But students don't really mind. So as long as uh, nobody ever criticized my drawings, which are, and these are Jörn's drawings, these are not my drawings. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it doesn't need to be glossy. As long as you put good effort into didactics and really teaching the, the subject and helping the students, it doesn't have to be that polished as long as you're a good teacher. Which also brings us to the picture of, of, the, oh, sorry, of the, 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 the naked teacher. If you're teaching an online course, it's very frightening because it's all about the students achieving understanding. At any normal setting, you have a certificate to bribe or coerce students with. You know, you say, if you want this certificate, you better listen to me and you better learn this, this, this concept. Read the book, go through it. We don't have anything like that. We don't have certificates. We are basically bound to give good courses or any minute there's a chance we might lose students. Our courses are eight hours, I think, in total, if you watch all the videos, eight hours, ten hours. Something plus, like, plus tons and tons of extra homework. Of extra homework, so you really need to put in time. The average YouTube video, like five minute YouTube video, I think 10% is watched until the end. So, and, and we're asking students to, to stay with us and do homework for a very, very long time. So what do we think about the critics? Well, I already said it, you know, much of, of the criticism about massive open online courses can also be applied to traditional universities, you know, the, the, the lack of consistent quality. I think this is not something very new. And it's, it's mostly also unfair comparisons. So if you go out and read what, what most of the criticisms about massive open online courses, or MOOCs, I, I really hate the word, is about, it's, it's always taking, oh, this is what the course currently looks like. So, you know, we, we did an undercover investigation as students of Udacity or Coursera, and here's Harvard. And it's not like Harvard, so it has to be bad. And, and this is, of course, a very unfair criticism in, in two points. One is, why, why should it even be? I mean, as long as the quality is good and it's free, it's a great thing to have. And we actually think that the online courses, although they try to, don't have to compete with universities. It's just a new resource to learn stuff, you know, without a certification or just getting that skill and learning something for free, which can't be bad. Just can't be. So, how do we proceed from here? Ah. <laughs> we already mentioned these challenges. Yeah, they are compiled together on one single slide. So the average MOOC, if you really look into lots of these MOOCs, the average MOOC is not really convincing in terms of quality. But then again, the average university lecturer wouldn't also not be convincing in terms of quality, but nobody looks into the standard university lecture. So we need to improve that quality, of course. Who pays for that quality? Big question. And once we introduce business, because somebody has to pay for that quality, once we introduce <laughs> business, what about our idealism? We want to change the world, we want to save the world. Can we combine that with earning money or having somebody earn that money? Tough spot. And of course, if we really want to provide certificates at the end, if we really want to have students graduate from MOOCs, how could we go about that? Maybe we can also say something to illustrate the point on quality. So mm -hmm. um, this Udacity course that, that runs for 10 hours, um, it's, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of work that goes into that. So it's not, I mean, you know, Jörn and I, we had to prepare it, we had to record it. But after that, all those videos are edited, all those videos are error checked, um, all those videos, the exercises all need to be programmed on the, on the, on the back end, on the front end side. And so, the automatic grading scripts have to be done, which is the toughest script. part. <laughs> yes, which students always tend to break uh, with, with their ideas of what an answer should be. <laughs> so so it's, it's really a lot of effort and, and subsequently a lot of money that goes into production of just the one single course that goes online. But we have to say, 10 years ago people said, oh, you would need to spend, say, 1 million euros or 2 million euros to produce such a course. It's not in that order. Yes, we are... Five-digit, maybe? <laughs> I guess we can say five-digit. It's, it's not as expensive as everybody thought it would be ten years ago. So, we made up three different models. What could happen? Maybe these different models happen in parallel. Maybe we see all three incarnations of MOOCs in parallel. First thing is, MOOCs provide value for employers. MOOCs could teach specific skills required by one employer or by several employers, by a group of employers, the, um, these employers would pay for that MOOC, for the production of that MOOC, and would be able to pick the best students. 
from those who quote unquote graduate. And there would not be a formal certificate, you just would prove by doing the exercises, by doing your homework that you are able to do it and maybe that company on their own runs some in-house tests to check if you really are able to do it. That's what we see as one option of bringing businesses on that playing field. And actually that's what's happening, that was the original business model of Udacity and Coursera also has now taken over partially taken over that sort of business model, cooperation with, with employers, doing talent scouting. Second model, this may be the way that almost all universities are heading, apart from the elite institutions, trying to reduce cost. As Sebastian said, there are, there's us, expensive professors teaching, telling the same stuff every year that we told the year before, we just are no longer needed anymore. That's the assumption. Can we do that with MOOCs? And can we hence reduce the cost? The question is, what about quality? As we know, the quality of university education is not that good. Does it get better? Does it get worse? Hard to say. Third model, that would be the style of model that I would propose to this audience. Could you help us with that model? Could we have some sort of Wikipedia-style MOOCs, could we have some crowdsourcing going on here? Could we collaboratively create MOOCs for free, for everybody? Of course, there's lots of technical issues here. For instance, collaboratively editing video, recording video, that's a tough point. And Wikipedia was easy to do in, in that way that you simply have to agree on one single entry to that encyclopedia. But in this case, you have to agree about, say, eight hours or 16 hours of lectures, quizzes and whatever. Can you do that with, say, 100 persons cooperating? Hard to say. And it's also that, that uh, you know, if you compare it to Wikipedia, a Wikipedia article usually becomes better if you, you know, if you find something missing and you add it. Yeah. It usually becomes better. A lecture does not become better just by adding stuff. So, so a good lecture is also about leaving out certain, certain this things. Is, which, this is what we learned. The hardest yeah. part is to know what to leave out. Yeah. And I wouldn't want to have debated that. With <laughs> no. It's, it's, it's actually a choice you have to make as a lecturer. It's, it's not something you put out into a discussion. It's, it's your choice. That's what you have. It's, it's kind of the artistic freedom you have. When you the last remaining artistic yeah. freedom. Yeah. Yeah. So, are we on the way? So that's our, our uh, initial question. Are we on the way to freeing education? Well, first of all, there's our final quiz uh, for you. How much funding have the three big companies, the three big MOOC companies, Coursera, edX, and Udacity, received so far? And actually, they've all received it in 2012, because that's when they were founded or, or announced in case of Udacity. Have they in total received $10 million in funding? Okay. Who thinks it's $25 million? $25 million. <laughs> Who thinks it's $100 million? It actually is $100 million in funding. So... Hundred million dollars in funding. I wish you know getting startup money was that easy all the time. So, what about free education? I mean, I mean, you know, somebody is spending a hundred million dollars. Somebody will want something back for those plus million. interest. Plus interest, um, which in the case of venture capital is you know ten percent, ten percent, fifteen, one hundred. It's a lot. So. Well, in the case of freeing education, we, we definitely think yes. You know, so 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 if, if you don't talk about the, the money aspect of it, it's never been easier to publish content. Producing good content and a good course is still hard, but if you have a good lecture, it's easy to put it out there and you know get an audience for it. It's also easier with this concept as we talk about you know getting rid of the old habits that don't make sense. If if you want to design a course the way you think it should be, MOOCs I think are the easiest way to to do that. And you can also leave out obsolete content, you know, update the curriculum. That's a very nice, nice thing about it. And a good thing is also that it challenges the traditional university. So, you know, Udacity, there is a company that just puts out a statement. They have just shown, oh, each year we can educate, I don't know, 10,000, 15,000 programmers for free. So what is the university going to do? So, um, and rather than saying, you know, you know, having a big speech about we need to improve education, they just show that there's an alternative model, and I, I think you know, that challenge is always good for a system like that. Crowdsourcing, of course, that's also a model, although so far we haven't seen much success 
with that. We also have to have to add that there's just not you know the crowdsourcing always depends on on this critical mass of people actually engaging in, in, in the topic, and we haven't seen that yet, unfortunately. We, we see that in translations, in particular, yeah. Salman Khan has some success in that. You can also go out and translate Udacity courses if you want to. But... So that's then the other question. So we've just made hundred million dollars. Um, Free education? Well, you know, it's somewhat. So, so it's still free to sign up for the courses and take them, but somebody has to pay for it and the interest. And so who will pay? That's a question I think that's, that's still very, very open. And it kind of depends on the goal of education. So that's where the larger debate again comes in. So if employment and employability are the sole goal of education, and that is the way I think we treat education a lot of the time, it, not being said that that's the way it should be, but that's the way how it's treated with your certificate and everything, then maybe it's going to be the commercial route of you know, the, the free course and then the employers getting, getting data. Or if there's something more idealistic to strive for, um, then yeah, I guess we all have to pay. <laughs> I don't know, if something else. <laughs> We want to close with another quote. Books will soon be obsolete in schools. It's possible to teach every branch of human knowledge with a motion picture. Our school system will be completely changed in 10 years. We should have used that as a quiz. Maybe some of you know this is one century old. Um, we should be telling you that the educational system is a very slow mover. But there's hope. But there is hope. <laughs> Thanks Thank a lot. You.